Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, happy Valentine's Day for those of you out there. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you have a significant someone in your life, you, you show them love more than just once a year. Uh, but this is an important day, and I think it's important to, that we have reminders in our life that, that help us remember to make sure we're keeping priorities priorities. And that's one thing I love about church, is that it's a chance each week to pause and refocus and remember what life is all about and why, <laughs> why we are here on this planet and why we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And at the end of every service, we do communion, this time of, of communing together and really pausing and just taking a few minutes to focus on Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And so it, reminders are so important and vital for us to not forget this is what we're here for. This is why we are in this building, why we are watching online. This is what church and Christ and serving him is all about. It's about, uh, it's about eternity. It's about something bigger than what's on this planet. And I don't know about you, but I tend to forget things if I don't leave myself reminders. And so that's the beautiful thing about church is it's this awesome reminder to pause each week and to turn back and make sure Christ is number one. Let's open a day with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that we have hope because of him. And Lord, help us to always keep ourselves centered and focused on Christ and making sure that he is number one in our lives, that he is what everything else is all about. God, we love you so much. Uh, join us today in this place as we worship. In your name I pray, amen.
today we're going to be continuing our series on That Is Not in the Bible. And we're looking uh, this month at just some different things that, that people attribute to being in the Bible that actually aren't. And some of them are, are maybe verses like we looked at last week that, that people have taken verses and, and changed them a tiny bit or removed a word or added a word that, that changes the meaning and, and can impact the way we think. Uh, some of them are ones that, that are good thoughts, uh, good ideas that, that maybe people have, have come up with that, that don't say it in the Bible. Maybe it's either implied in the Bible or maybe it's something that's not said in the Bible that's, that's a practical piece of advice but not actually biblical. Uh, some of it is just things that, that we've made up and, and again can sometimes be harmful. And so this month we're looking at different things. Uh, today I want to look at the phrase that says, uh, do your best and let God do the rest. And that's a phrase that, that I think some people might say, well, I, f I think that's in the Bible. Uh, and a lot of people might say, well, I, I don't know if that exact phrase is in the Bible, but, but I think the, the teaching of that is in the Bible. And so we're going to look today at that phrase and, and see, is it in the Bible? What, what, what actually does the Bible say about that? God, uh, or doing your best and, and then letting God uh, do the rest. And now I looked it up this week, and between 68 and 82 percent of Christians, uh, depending on which study you look at, believe that this phrase or some version of it is somewhere in the Bible. Well, that's a big, uh, big chunk of people. That's a high percentage. And, and so it's important to, again, understand what, what does the Bible say? What, what truly are the words uh, that God speaks in the Bible? And so uh, we're going to look at that today. We're going to be in Romans most of the day. We're going to jump around a little bit, but mostly we'll be in Romans. Uh, today we're going to start in chapter 5, now starting in verse 6. And it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, in that passage, it calls us powerless. It calls us ungodly, and it calls us sinners. Now, if you, if you look at those three words that we are called as human beings, it doesn't paint a very nice picture. And I don't think it paints a picture of people who are, who are able to really do their best. It, it talks about Christ coming in and, and rescuing us. It talks about Christ. We couldn't do anything. It was literally impossible for us to save ourselves. Uh, we couldn't even part way get there. Christ had to come all the way to us. It wasn't a matter of us doing our best and him doing the rest. It was a matter of us being incapable and him coming down to help us. We couldn't help ourselves. I, I think of it as, as a baby, right? You think about a, a baby, a newborn child. And if you've been around a newborn child, you realize these things can't do anything to help themselves. They, they, can't, they can't roll over. They can't move. They can't go anywhere. If they make a mess in their pants, they can't change that. They can't even feed themselves until you basically put the food in their mouths. They can't even ask for help. They're, they're incapable. They can't hold their heads up alone. There is literally nothing that they can really do on their own. In fact, in fact, even sleeping, a lot of the time, they have to be held and rocked and comforted to be able to fall asleep because, because they just can't do it. They're unable to. It would be ridiculous for us to go to an infant and say, hey, look, I'll help you in this life. I'll help you, but you got to make effort first, and then I'll meet you where you're at. It's not, it's not possible. For, for a newborn baby to do that. And that's the way we are spiritually. We can't do anything. It takes God coming into our lives 
for us to recognize our need for him, for us to be able to, to turn to him, for us to be able to accept him to, and his salvation. There's nothing that we are able to do without him. So then this, this do your best and let God do the rest, well, where, where does that come from? Is, is there a place in the Bible that talks about that? Well, in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, it says, do everything as working for the Lord, not for men. And so it encourages us to have high work ethics, to do our best in all things in life, to, to not uh, be lazy, but to, to put in effort. But it doesn't say when, when talking about putting in effort and work in the things of this world, it says nowhere that, that if we do our best, God will do the rest. In fact, in fact, <laughs> if you look at some of the, the characters and people in the Bible, there are times when we see that not happening. I mean, I think about Joseph in the Old Testament and this, this man who was, who was uh, sold into slavery by his own brothers who worked his way up in, in one man's household only not, because, not through any fault of his own, but somebody lying about him, him serving God and, and yet being lied about and thrown into prison. And then in prison, him working his way up. And again, the, the prison being blessed, but through no fault of his own, his being forgotten about for years. And it's it's him doing his best, and yet we don't see God doing the rest. He didn't bless Joseph necessarily at Potiphar's house. He blessed jo Potiphar. He didn't necessarily bless Joseph. He didn't necessarily bless Joseph in prison. He blessed the, the, the prison uh, ward. He blessed the prison, but it didn't really, we don't really see him blessing Joseph. We see Paul working in this world, doing his best as a missionary, and we don't see God making his path smooth or easy. Paul had to work for that, and we see that over and over and over again. People working, and that doesn't mean God's not with them. That doesn't mean God's not helping them, but we don't see doing them doing their best and then God taking care of the rest of the situation for them. And we think so much, it's natural, it's the way we are taught to think that, that if we do our best in this world, that God will help us. If we do our best at, at work, then, then God's going to make things work out with our jobs. If, if we do our best with our family, God's going to make everything turn out. But we don't always see when we do our best, God doing the rest. But I do think that there is uh, places where this kind of has some truth. Uh, if you look at we, me, with me uh, in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 12, it says this. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we see here that we're to continue to work out our salvation. Now, what does that mean? Work out your salvation. Does that mean we're supposed to try to save ourselves? No, no, no. That's, <laughs> that's definitely not what that means. We've already been saved. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have that promise of salvation. We have that gift at that moment, but, but it's our job as Christians. It's what we're called to do out of gratitude to live for Christ. We're called to be obedient to him, to serve him, and that's us working out our salvation. We're supposed to be, be living righteous lives for him. And not only living righteous lives, but living righteous lives in perseverance, continuing and not giving up when things get difficult or hard. And so we see this idea of us, of us working hard, but, but what does it even say here? If you look back at verse 12, the second half, and then into verse 13, it says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And so we see this, this fear and trembling, this working out salvation in fear and trembling actually has to do with us in fear and trembling before God. 
And it's not so much a, a cowardice or a, a, a being nervous and shaking in our boots as a matter of respect to God, realizing who he is, realizing what he's done for us, recognizing the power that he has in life. And so it's, it's us having fear and trembling because we recognize that we couldn't save ourselves. And we continue to recognize that even as we're trying to, uh, to uh, work on our salvation, we're reliant on Him. We need Him. In fact, again, back in Philippians, it says, with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. And so even as we're trying to, to uh, work out our salvation, it's God who's doing the working out. We have, to, we have to be willing to open ourselves up to allow him to work in us. We have to be willing to do our best to live in obedience for him. But it's God ultimately still and not us who, who really works towards our salvation, who works out our salvation. And again, we see that we really are incapable now, there's some, some truth when it says, do your best, let God do the, the rest. We see there's some truth there that we, are, we have to open ourselves up to him, and we want to give our best effort. But really and truly, again, we are incapable, not only of saving ourselves, but even living for Christ without him being the one doing the work in us. And it's, it's very humbling to realize how much and how desperately we need God. And yet, and yet it's a good thing, I think. I, I think it's very, a very good thing because if we go back to Romans, and if we go back a couple chapters from where we were earlier to Romans 3, in verses 23 and 24 it says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And we see here that, that all of us have messed up. And that's the, that's the exciting thing about this, this whole conversation is, is if we do our best and then have to let God do the rest, for each of us, our best is different. For each of us, if, if, we were, if we were reliant on ourselves to do the best that we could, each of us would do a little bit better or worse than, than those around us. And those who, who had done worst would, would have this struggle of, of how miserable am I? What a horrible wretch. And then those who did better would, would have this, this thing that they could stand on and, and be proud about and be prideful and boast about in themselves rather than in Christ. And it's like jumping across the Grand Canyon, right? Somebody may jump six inches out. Somebody may jump five feet out, but we're all going to fall in the end. But if, if when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to our living for Christ, if, if we truly think, well, we, all we have to do is our best, and then God will cover the rest of that distance, the problem with that is that, is that it does separate us. And it's only when we realize that, that we can't do our best. We have no ability to do anything Without Christ, we can't be righteous. We can't be saved. We can't live for him. We can't have eternity without Christ. And it's not about us doing our best and letting God do the rest. It's about us being willing to let Christ come in and help us from the very beginning. We can't do it on our own. We have all fallen Short, And it doesn't matter if your short is six inches or six feet. We've fallen short. And we can't do it on our own. And it doesn't matter what our best is. It matters that we allow God into our lives. If we are seeking salvation, we can't do that on our own. We can't save ourselves. We can't earn it. And it only comes from God at work in our lives. 
And if we are seeking pursuit of God, if we're seeking to live righteous lives for Him, it doesn't come from us trying and trying and trying, and then God pulling us the rest of the way. It comes from us opening ourselves to allow Him to work in our lives and recognizing we can't even do that on our own. We can't even get a step forward on our own. It's only through God that we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling in Him. And so today, I want to I leave you just with one question today. Uh, usually I try to leave you with three, but today I just want to leave you with one single question. And that question is this, what can you do to open yourself up and allow God in? What, what, what's causing you to stay closed right now and to keep God from, from working in your life? Is it, is it pride? Is it this feeling of going, I, I just need to do my best and then I'll let God do the rest. And, and so you don't let him actually come in and work at all because you're still trying to do as much as you can to meet him part way. Is it, is it the other end of the spectrum? Is it this feeling of, of complete inadequacy? Well, other people seem better than me. They seem more righteous than me. They seem like they've got things more all together than I do. And so why, why should I even let God at work if I can't even meet him part way? Is it, is it something else? What is it that's, that's not allowing you to let God come in and work in your life? To allow him to be the one to help you work out your salvation. We can't save ourselves. If you're not a Christian, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God is reaching out right now. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You don't have to try to be good enough. You don't have to, to cross uh, the line in order to, to, to accept it. All you have to do is allow that, is allow Christ to work in your life is accept Him as your Lord and Savior. That's all you have to do. If you're trying to live for Christ and you've been struggling and wrestling through that lately, what can you do to open yourself up and realize it's not about me, it's not about my struggle and my efforts. This comes from God. I need to allow Him to work in my life to help me get obedient and following and righteous in his eyes. It's not about me. It's about God. Let's close today with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for, for Jesus. I thank you that you sent him to this earth for us. Lord, we, we didn't deserve it. That's for sure. Lord, we can't do anything to earn it. Uh, but Lord, I thank you that, that you sent Jesus here to work on this earth and to work in our lives. Lord, I thank you that, that even after we accept you as our Lord and Savior, that, that you don't abandon us. You don't expect us to just continue to figure things out on our own or to do our best and then you'll step into our lives. Lord, I thank you that, that you're here from the beginning and that you're even the reason that we can, we can have salvation and righteousness and be obedient at all. Lord, help us to listen to your leading. Help us to follow where you go. Help us not to be lazy and sit back, but help us to do our best efforts to allow you in and to serve you. In your name I pray. Amen.
Happy Valentine's Day. I'd like to go back to Todd's communion meditation from last week and focus on it's all about love. Let's go back to the cross. God sacrificed his son to forgive us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. He made the ultimate sacrifice as a gift in grace for us. But it doesn't end there. As we each chose that very precious gift of asking Jesus into our hearts, we received yet another gift. We became family. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? Though we were our many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. 2020 began a time of separation. Yet, even though we've been separated, we really are all together as Christ's family, brothers and sisters, to love one another as he loved us. And I think it's really, really important to remember that, especially if we're feeling alone or isolated, that we have family in each other. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're with us, that you've united us, that we're together in love in our hearts and souls and daily life, thanks to you and your Son and the Holy Spirit living in us. Help us, please, to remember to love each and every person who we meet every day of our life and remember to share you with them because you're the one who will make a difference forever. We thank you through your Son. Amen. There's one day of the year when love is celebrated in abundance. Big red hearts passed to all of our friends, bags of the best chocolate consumed by the pound, cards, candy, nice meals, surprise gifts. It's lavish and lovely and reminds us of all the good things. But what does love look like when it spills to every other day of the year? Maybe it's food banks always stocked, hard conversations over hot cups of coffee, holding the hand of a stranger, sticking it out through hard times, sitting in grief, it's not even yours, delivering hope through a simple card, laughter and goodwill, provision, protection, patience, forgiveness before it's asked, walking a mile in another's shoes. We know this kind of love because we saw it. Love is the sun willing to hang on the cross the God willing to die in our place, the Father who had a plan to save his children from the moment he created us. You were always on his heart, and still are, every day of the year. Hi, it's Ben. I just have a couple announcements for you this week. First off, we're starting a first Sunday of the month communion service in March. 
It'll be the first Sunday of the month, starting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, there'll be an invite to the Zoom meeting uh, during the in the church email sent out. Uh, it'll just be a short time of communion meditation and then uh, some fellowship. Everyone's invited. Please join us for that. Next, just a reminder that we have several life groups meeting carefully in person or on Zoom right now. So if you are interested in getting connected with one of those life groups, uh, there is information uh, in the church lobby, or you can contact the office. Just also a reminder to uh, fill out the connection card at newportchristian.com slash connect. Thank you guys for everything that you do, and have a great week. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's great to have you uh, join in and worship with us this morning. Uh, you know, we make fun sometimes lightheartedly. We tease kids about, well, life isn't fair. And we tell them, if you're a parent, you've probably said that. Life isn't fair. You know, it's not the way things work out. And yet, and yet even as parents, I think sometimes we, we don't believe life is fair and that it should be. And we look at the guy over next who got the promotion and, and we go, well, how come I didn't get the promotion? I've, I've put in more hours. I've been at this company longer. I, I'm a better worker than that guy. Or we see somebody else getting a reward and we go, how come they're getting the reward when, when I've done more, when I've been better? Or we look at, at this lady and we go, well, how come she seems like her life is all together? How come everything she seems to want seems to be happening when I'm doing things the right way? I'm trying to live the way God wants me to, and yet, and yet for me it's a struggle, and for that person it seems so easy. And the truth of the matter is that, that God doesn't promise to make life easy or fair, but he promises to be there with us and to help us through. He promises to give us salvation if we ask him. He promises, promises us to help us live in righteousness and obedience to him if we allow him to. And it's him doing the work. We just have to be willing to open ourselves up to him. If you, need, if you need help this week, if you need some prayers as you try to, to be willing to open yourself up to Christ and allow Him to work in you, if you need guidance or direction, if you need somebody to just pray for you, uh, if you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want to know what, what does that look like, how can I do that, uh, please reach out this week. You can call 541 265-2531 or email office at newportchristian.com and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Let's close today with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for being at work and I thank you for, for overcoming our weaknesses for us. Lord, we can't do it. We're not good enough or strong enough or powerful enough. Only you have the ability to offer salvation, to offer a life uh, lived in righteousness. And God, help us to open ourselves up to you and allow you to work in us. In your name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.